Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ben Mickens. And thanks for the invitation. And thanks for everyone for joining today. So um, uh, when uh, Ben invited me for this talk, I asked him uh, how, how, what should be the time span of my talk. And he said that we don't have a fixed time span. And uh, I thought that is like telling a driver that they are in Autobahn in Germany, uh, they won't stop. And, um, but I made myself uh, uh, ensure that my talk is not too long, not to bore you too much. So uh, today uh, I'll be talking about um, adsorption behavior of surfactants at metal water interfaces. Uh, I have given my contact information here. So if you have questions, if you want to connect offline, feel free to send me an email. And first I would like to start uh, by giving you a molecular picture. Uh, because uh, I'm doing molecular simulations, so we should understand what is happening at the level of the molecules. So here I'm showing you a glass of water, and uh, I'm saying that this glass of water is uh, suppose at one thermodynamic state. By that, I mean that the glass of water is at a specific temperature, say room temperature, at a specific pressure of one atmosphere uh, and a specific density of one gram per cc. And for a considerable period of time, we will not see any changes uh, in the in these thermodynamic variables that describe um, this uh, glass of water. And so we say that we are in one particular thermodynamic state and we are in equilibrium. Uh, but in reality, what is happening, if you look at the molecules, uh, the molecules at room temperatures, they move at very fast speeds. They move in at speeds of 600 meters per second. Um, they also have atomic vibrations, like if water molecules are made up of oxygen and hydrogen atoms, and you have vibrations between oxygen and hydrogen atoms, and they are very high frequency vibrations. Like in one second, you will have 10 to the power 14 vibrations. Um, and then molecules also collide a lot with each other different molecules and that collision frequency is very high. So you can imagine that within one second, uh, when we think of a thermodynamic state and we say nothing is happening, but really at the molecular level, a lot of changes are happening. Molecules are moving around, bouncing off each other and changing their position and their velocities. A lot of uh, activity is ha happening and it's kind of a very chaotic system. So um, a thermodynamic state is actually a collection of many, many molecular configurations. A one molecular configuration is one arrangement of molecules in space. And molecules are con continuously changing their configuration. So you have many configurations that are actually comprising one thermodynamic state. So what do we do in molecular simulations is that we generate these molecular configurations on, com on a computer to represent a thermodynamic state. And there are many ways in which you can generate molecular configurations uh, using a computer. Uh, one of the most popular ones is called uh, molecular dynamics. In molecular dynamics, we study the molecular motion by numerically integrating the classical laws of motion. So we have these molecules, they have electrons and protons, and so they apply electrostatic forces on each other. So we have these forces and the interesting part is that at the level of molecules, not at the level of electrons and uh, single protons, but at the level of molecules, the classical laws, which were developed by Newton, like 200 or 300 years back, they are still applicable. They are still able to describe the motion of the molecules. So if you can evaluate the force acting on the molecules, you can find out what is their acceleration, what is their velocity, and how their position will change as a function of time. And you basically simulate the motion of the molecules. Then there's a theory of statistical mechanics that basically connects molecular trajectories to thermodynamic properties. So you have these laws of statistical mechanics from where you get back your thermodynamic properties. So what is the advantage of this? The advantage of this is that Suppose you want to study a compl complex problem um, for which you know the thermodynamic state. Uh, you can study it at the molecular level to see how the molecules behave. And you understand what is happening at the molecular level that is basically getting reflected in the 
thermodynamic uh, properties that we are seeing or observing. Now I'll tell you a little bit about the time scales that are involved in molecular simulations. Like we are doing numerical simul numerical integration of classical equations of motion, and we want to capture every uh, small frequency change, every small um, position change that is happening in the molecules. So if the molecules are vibrating, we want to capture those vibrations. And for that reason, the time step that we need to choose in molecular dynamics is very small. It is 10 raised to power minus 15 seconds, which is called a femtosecond. So because a time step is so small, uh, to simulate even one nanosecond, which is 10 raised to power minus nine seconds, you need to do one million calculations. And if you are simulating, say, thousands and thousands of molecules, then you are doing these one million calculations for each of those thousands of molecules. So, of course, uh, you cannot do it by hand. So, you need to use a computer to do these calculations. Now, uh, here I'm showing you a bottle of milk. And uh, we know that in 10 days, the milk goes bad, but no physical, uh, physically observable changes happen in a nanosecond or even in a second or even in an hour. The milk remains same or we don't see any, we are unable to perceive any change in the composition of the milk or in the quality of the milk when we are looking at the milk in time span of few hours. So you can imagine that if we can only simulate few nanoseconds of uh, say milk, then we may conclude that milk is stable. Okay, if that is all we can see, we will see that nothing is happening in the milk, it will remain stable. But interesting physics often happens at very long time scales, like in the case of milk, where we have phase separation of the fatty part and the aqueous part. Uh, in the span of 10 days. So the challenge is how do we bridge the long time scales for which we have interesting physics to the time scales that we can simulate. So that is a challenge. And uh, as it is said that if you can imagine something, then you can actually end up do you, you end up doing that. So the scientists have figured out how to basically bridge this kind of long time scales. You use some special molecular simulation techniques to bridge such long time scales. And I'll be talking about some of those techniques in this talk. Now let's come to the topic of interest with this brief introduction about uh, molecular simulations. So why do we need to study surfactants on metal surfaces? What is the use of uh, this um, study? So one is that um, there's a lot of interest in uh, synthesizing anisotropic gold nanoparticles. Okay, so uh, what is done is that you take a small gold crystal or a small seed and you introduce some surfactants. Now surfactants end up absorbing on specific facets or specific si uh, sides of these seeds. And then you have growth on other sides or other facets. So you get anisotropic particles and people have developed many kinds of uh, different particles like rods, prisms, stars, and so on, using different surfactants in different conditions. So we want to understand how surfactants are absorbing on these surfaces. Another interesting application is in heterogeneous catalysis. So suppose uh, you are doing uh, a reaction, but you have two competing uh, reactions that, that can happen um, because of um, the similar uh, reaction mechanisms then what people have discovered is that if you have some surfactants which are coating the surface of the catalyst, then these surfactants basically allow some molecules to uh, go near the surface and sterically hinder other molecules from the surface. And there are many other mechanisms, but through these mechanisms, they significantly are able to increase the reactivity of one reaction or the selectivity of one reaction as compared to other reactions. So for increasing the selectivity in heterogeneous catalysis, surfactants are used. But the primary focus of our work is in corrosion inhibition. Now in corrosion inhibition, um, what is done is we have pipelines which are like thousands and thousands of miles long. And um, these 
these are oil pipelines. So they go from the oil well and transport oil and gas to different regions uh, where they are like purified and then they are refined and then they are transported further to uh, the gas stations. So sometimes these oil wells are under the sea. Sometimes they are near the polar uh, regions. They are sometimes maybe uh, in regions where they are not ex easily accessible uh, inland also. So we have these thousands and thousands of miles long pipelines and they get corroded because whenever you are taking out oil from um, oil wells, you always have water. And when you have water and metal surface, then you have corrosion. So what uh, the oil and gas companies do is that they inject corrosion inhibitors in these oil pipelines. These corrosion inhibitors uh, go to the surface of these metal um, uh, pipe, uh, pipes and they basically inhibit corrosion. Now, um, why university has a very big corrosion center and they are closely working with the oil and gas industry uh, in which like uh, we get direct funding from the oil and gas industry and we do experiments uh, and now we are doing simulations for them so that they can understand the mechanism of uh, corrosion inhibition through uh, the corrosion inhibitors. So uh, I joined uh, Y University six years back and uh, at that time uh, people from the industry they were like working uh, on this problem for many decades and for them uh, like they were very skeptical about what uh, simulations can give them because they were thinking that um, the kind of environment you have uh, is very complex and simulations may be too simplistic to be able to give uh, something uh, that is useful. So I connected to um, the movie, uh, I, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it's a very interesting movie, 12 Angry Men, in which uh, initially everybody is very skeptical and very like they, they feel that one person actually has committed the crime. And very slowly they start getting convinced that the person is actually innocent. And something similar, like I've been interacting with the people in the industry for six years now. I give talks and my students give talks every six months and as we keep increasing the complexity of our systems and try to give them a molecular picture of what we say and they are able to connect it to their experiments, uh, the skepticism has been decreasing. Uh, but overall, uh, like we want molecular simulations to be at the same pedestal as experiments, like we should be able to help experiments in solving problems, uh, help uh, the industry in solving problems, just like the uh, experimentalists are able to do. Okay, so let's talk about corrosion inhibitors. Um, so corrosion inhibitors are surfactants. So here I'm showing you a typical corrosion inhibitor that is used in the oil and gas industry. Um, why uh, they are surfactants? Why surfactants are used as corrosion inhibitors is because surfactants have an alkyl tail. Now this alkyl tail is hydrophobic. That means it does not like water. And so the understanding is that the alkyl tail will repel water. And then we have the polar head group. And it is understood that the polar head group will strongly adsorb on the metal surface. So you, ha you have these two components with their own individual rules. And the expectation is that the polar groups will go to the metal surface and the alkyl tails will dangle uh, to on will be exposed uh, to the aqueous phase. And so you have a co uh, corrosion resistance hydrophobic film. Okay. And so this is the basic picture that uh, people in the industry have in mind. This is how corrosion inhibitors work. And um, we wanted to see, okay, with this simple picture, uh, let us see what molecular simulations can tell us what is really happening in the system. Okay, so we started with a simple model of a corrosion inhibitor molecule. So we said, okay, this is a molecule with all its chemistry, polar groups, and alkyl tails of the hydrogens and carbons. Let us simplify uh, the system and make a simple model. So we have um, a hydrophobic tail and we have a polar head group. So we have a linear molecule with these beads, which are representing the alkyl uh, beads, alkyl groups. 
and we have one bead which is representing the polar head. And the way we have modeled uh, this molecule is that the polar head has very strong affinity for the metal surface, which is experimentally known. And the, and the alkyl beads, these alkyl tail, they have hydrophobic interactions between themselves. So they are attractive to each other in the aqueous environment. And so uh, to basically um, make this model uh, similar to um, the surfactant, uh, surfactant molecules, uh, we have introduced some molecular interactions and I will briefly tell you about those interactions. So uh, in molecular simulations, First thing is that we don't use um, uh, standard units. We don't use SI units because those units are very difficult to handle in, on a computer. Like you can imagine that molecules are very small in size. So you cannot represent the molecular mass in kgs and they are so small in like, uh, you can, we won't represent their diameters in meters, right? okay? So um, here, like for the energy, we use a uh, a reduced unit in which we say that the, let the thermal energy, which is given by Boltzmann constant times temperature, uh, it is a unit of energy. Let us set that to one, and all other interactions will be uh, income like relative to the thermal energy. Okay, so we set the hydrophobic interactions to be uh, a small value as compared to the thermal energy. So hydrophobic interactions between alkyl beads are represented by what is called Leonard Jones potential. The Leonard Jones potential is attractive um, at short distances, but also at very short distances, it is repulsive. That means it will not allow two atoms or two beads to sit on top of each other. They have excluded volume or they have finite size. So they cannot sit on top of each other. But beyond that, they have some attraction, which is captured by this Leonard Jones potential. Okay. Um, I will not talk about the functional form of this potential to keep this uh, talk uh, less math oriented, um, but this, um, this is the well depth of how strong the interaction is. So just remember that this epsilon value tells us how strong is the attraction between the alkyl tails. The larger the number of epsilon means the stronger the attraction between the alkyl tails. Okay. Uh, now, uh, when you have a polar group in water, then that polar group is very well uh, solvated with water. Because the polar group is solvated with water, it, it does not have very strong interactions with other polar groups. They, all the polar groups try to remain solvated and far away from each other. And that's why we have a very simple interaction between the polar groups and the polar groups and the hydrophobic groups. That is called the uh, WCA potential. Uh, just remember that there is actually no interaction between uh, the, the polar groups. It is just that the polar groups do not allow other polar groups to sit on top of each other. Okay, so it is called only excluded volume repulsion. Then as we discussed that the polar group has very strong interaction with the surface. Now this strong interaction is captured by a potential which is called 9-3 potential, which is nothing but integrated Leonard Jones potential. It is a longer range potential, slightly longer range potential than the Leonard Jones potential. And just to have a very strong interaction between the polar bead and the surface, uh, we have set the well depth or the strength of the interaction to five, which is five times the thermal energy, which is very strong. And we are not setting these values by our like by hit and trial. Uh, we have looked at Okay, what is the uh, approximate hydrophobic interaction between two alkyl tails? And uh, we choose a value so that we are able to represent that, um, that strength of interaction. Similarly, we have looked at other calculations like density functional theory calculations to figure out what should be the strength of interaction between polar groups and the surface. And that is how we set these values. Okay, so with that, so this is how a system looks like. Okay, so we have our metal surface here, which is a planar surface. And what we do is we randomly insert surfactant molecules on top of this metal surface. And we do the simulation and we see what happens. Okay. So uh, the first study that we did 
turned out to be a very interesting study. So first we tried to test the hypothesis, which was uh, quite prevalent in the minds of people who are working in the industry. That it is the polar group that is responsible for adsorption. And alkyl tails are simply there to repel water. Okay, so how, how did we test it, this hypothesis? What we did is that we did not change the strong interaction between the polar head and the surface. That was kept fixed equal to five times KT. So we had a very strong interaction between the polar group and the surface. But what we did was we made the epsilon, that is the attraction between the, the hydrophobic attraction between the alkyl tails very small. Okay. So now alkyl tails are not attractive to each other. There is no hydrophobic interaction. And when we simulated this, we did not see a lot of adsorption happening. We saw just random adsorption happening. Some molecules will adsorb, but the remaining molecules will not adsorb. And then we started turning on uh, the attractive interaction between the alkyl tails. So we started turning on the hydrophobic interactions. And what we see was a dramatic increase in the number of adsorbed molecules. And here what we found is that when the hydrophobic interactions are completely turned on, what we get is a self-assembled monolayer. So all the molecules are now standing on the surface and they are completely packing the surface and they are quite well arranged. And as you can see, they're completely covering the surface. So you get a self-assembled monolayer. So really what is happening is that it is not only the polar group that is driving adsorption. If you only have the polar group, you will not get good adsorption. You need the alkyl tail to get very strong adsorption. And this, did, this was a bit of an eye-opening uh, result for people in the industry. But at the same time, they were able to connect it to the experimental results that they have observed. So in the um, experiments that uh, it has been observed that if you have the alkyl tail smaller than uh, six carbon, then you do not get good corrosion inhibition. And um, the only reason for this was that this uh, six carbon tail is basically not repelling water that well. But um, what we find is that it is actually not absorbing that strongly as well. Okay, now, um, so the main conclusion was that hydrophobic tail interactions are important for adsorption. They are simply not there to repel water. Okay, and then uh, we looked at the other hypothesis, like the, uh, the hypothesis that is the polar group, which is strongly uh, uh, adsorbed, which is responsible for the strong adsorption of the molecules. So how do you make a polar group more polar? Okay, so if you want stronger adsorption, then you would like the polar group to be more polar. Okay, um, So you will make a polar group more polar by adding more uh, uh, species, more moieties to the polar group, like maybe another aromatic ring, another amine group. And so what you'll do is you'll make the polar group bulkier and bulkier. And if you're making the polar group bulkier compared to the alkyl tail, then what you're doing is you're changing the shape of your um, molecule and in the quest of getting better adsorption. So, uh, but how the shape changes the adsorption was something that was not really uh, considered as an important uh, factor when looking at the adsorption. So what we did was, um, like this is the result that I've shown you before, that here we have the linear molecules, surfactant molecules, they form a planar geometry, planar adsorption morphology on the surface. But if you have a larger head group, Okay, here we have the head group in this, these simulations, we have head groups which are twice the size of one alkyl bead. So if you have a larger head group, you actually form cylindrical micelles in the adsorbed state as well as in the aqueous phase. Now these cylindrical micelles have these water channels through which water can penetrate. So uh, you may actually have a lower corrosion inhibition uh, if you make the polar group much uh, bigger. Okay, so the geometry matters. Basically, that's the important point that we found here. Okay, so uh, till then, till uh, the previous results, we had only looked at the equilibrium uh, behavior of uh, 
the surfactant molecules on the surface like finally what kind of configurations do you get okay when equilibrium thermodynamic equilibrium is reached then we started looking at the kinetics of surfactant adsorption and to tell you a bit more about like what is observed in the experiments here i am showing you a paper that was published in science in 1996 Uh, here the researchers were studying the adsorption of alkane thiol on gold so they start here with a pristine gold surface and when the adsorption began they started noticing these stripes that appear on the surface as you can see you have these stripes appearing on the surface and then eventually the entire surface gets covered with these stripes okay and then what they saw was um adsorption does not stop when the surface is covered with stripes but you get these uh, more uh, light colored regions and eventually the entire surface is covered with these light colored regions and when they looked at the topography of the surface they came up with this kind of picture that initially the molecules are lying parallel to the surface and then they are covering the entire surface by lying parallel to the surface and then there is an orientational transition by orientational transition i mean that the molecules are now changing their orientation as to how they are adsorbed so they start st standing up on the surface and eventually they start standing up and they completely cover the surface while standing up so they form a self assembled monomer layer on the surface okay so we said okay yeah that is quite interesting why is this happening so we said okay uh, we came up with this uh, adsorption mechanism so initially you have a bare metal surface you have the surfactant molecule that is going towards the surface and initially uh, you have the molecules which are uh, completely covering the surface while lying down uh, on the surface now the molecules will lie down because that increases the that maximizes their interaction with the surface okay the alkyl tails are also interacting with the surface the polar head is also interacting with the surface so you are maximizing the interaction so you will have this now two things can happen if the tail has strong interaction with the surface if the tail alkyl tail is also interacting with the surface strongly then nothing will happen you may have multiple layers of molecules adsorbed but you will always get the striped configurations on the other hand if the polar head group is has much stronger interaction as compared to the alkyl tails we should expect an orientational transition why we should expect an orientational transition is because when the molecules start standing up on the surface then they occupy less surface area that means more polar groups will be able to reach the surface and lower the free energy of the system okay so we said that okay let us try to make a theoretical model uh, based on this idea so the main idea is that the molecules adsorbed in standing up state occupy less surface area as compared to the molecules that are in the lying down state so we have our uh, surfactant molecule we can treat it as a cylinder uh, we we have we know all the geometrical properties the cross sectional area the length the diameter and then we also know or we can tune the interactions we have the tail surface interactions so if there is uh, epsilon is the interaction of one tail bead or one alkyl bead with the surface and if we have n beads then we have n into um the epsilon as the total tail surface interaction and then we have the interaction of the polar head group with the surface which is given by this epsilon and then we also know what is the packing fraction of the molecules in their self assembled monolayer which is represented by f so we can calculate the energy associated with the lying down configuration and the standing up configuration and if we look at the ratio of the two energies the ratio of the two energies depends on the geometrical properties of the molecule which we already know because we are designing this molecule on the computer and also the interaction strength of the head and the tail with the surface okay now you can imagine that when this ratio is 1 that means the molecule does not care whether it is lying down or standing up on the surface because those two energies are the same so what we did was uh, we did a large number of simulations to well to test our model in those simulations we changed the tail surface interaction and the head surface interaction we changed these values okay and using the equation that i showed you before 
uh, we were able to we will be able to predict for what conditions the lying down configuration will have the same energy as the standing up configuration and this line is representing that theoretical value and each of these points is a result of our simulation so what we see is that if we are at a low value of head surface interaction so the polar group has a small interaction with the surface then the molecules prefer to be in the lying down state as our as our model will predict because the tail has comparable interaction with the surface so the molecule will have no tendency to stand up on the surface so you get the lying down configuration in the simulations so our simulations predicted the same thing that you will get lying down configurations but as you keep increasing the head surface interaction or the pole the polar group surface interaction you see that eventually you start ha having configurations in which the molecules are standing up on the surface and what we found is that our model which has no uh, fitting parameters is able to quantitatively predict this kind of change in the configuration that is happening uh, in the uh, uh, adsorbed state of the molecules okay so uh, the second thing that i mentioned uh, that was observed in the experiments was that there is an orientational transition so here i am simulating the point that i have circled in the in the phase diagram and as you can see it is a blue square that means it is here we found that the molecules are actually standing up on the surface in the final configuration but here i am showing you a movie in which i am showing you how the adsorption is happening it was a very very long movie and that's why you will see that it's not smooth but you will have molecular motion initially you will see that the molecules are lying parallel to the surface more or less the molecules are parallel to the surface then you will see that some molecules have now started standing up on the surface and that is like a nucleation mechanism you will see that the entire surface is now covered with molecules that are standing up on the surface that creates more um, space for molecules to adsorb and you will see that in finally the entire surface will be covered with molecules that are standing up on the surface so you you saw that orientational transition which was also observed in the experiments and so our simulations were able to show that kind of orientation transit orientational transition happening so um, now the question is what about other geometries what we looked at was a linear molecule but we also studied the molecule in which the polar head group is larger than the alkyl tails and in that case we can write the same equations that we wrote the energy of molecules standing up on the surface energy of the molecules lying down on the surface area covered by these molecules and so on and the uh, equations to do the same kind of uh, calculation and we did the same thing we changed the tail surface interaction and the head surface interaction and figured out how the molecules are uh, in like achieving their adsorbed configuration on the surface in that case also like this is the theoretical line that our model predicts and uh, what we figured out is that our simulations actually again quantitatively explain the adsorption morphologies when the molecules are lying down on the surface and when the molecules are standing up on the surface interestingly uh, for these uh, systems uh, for these kind of surfactants we saw that there are also mixed configurations in which some molecules are actually lying down on the surface and some molecules are standing up on the surface and those mixed configurations were observed close to the theoretical line okay so the transition is not uh, zero or one it is basically like uh, goes through a mixed configuration and then it goes to the other configuration okay but our model was again found to be quantitatively accurate in predicting the configurations how do we know uh, what kind of configuration we have so i'm just giving you an example like here uh, i'm looking at the orientation of molecules that that are adsorbed on the surface so what are what is the angle these molecules are making with the surface so the lying down configuration shows a certain signature and the standing up configuration sh shows a certain signature i will not go in uh, too much detail about explaining like what these peaks and mean but as you can see that we can have very we have very distinct signatures of lying down and standing up configurations so we can easily identify whether the molecules are lying down or standing up we can also look at the distribution of molecules from the surface like how the molecules are arranged as a function of um, distance from the surface and standing up and lying down configurations have 
very distinct signatures. So it is easy to see whether the molecules are lying down or standing up. Now here I'm showing you a top view of the standing up configuration as well as the lying down configuration. Remember here the polar head group is bigger than the alkyl tails. So uh, the V get cylinders like I showed you before. So when we have the standing up configuration, you see that you have these cylinders, not exactly linear cylinders, but of different shapes. And when we have molecules that are lying down, that are achieving the lying down configuration, you get these hemispheres on the surface. Okay, this is the top view. Okay, uh, so uh, we can predict what kind of configurations molecules can form. Uh, another problem that we solved um, was something that was uh, frequently reported in experiments uh, and uh, it was not exactly understood what is happening. So what was seen in experiments is that if you have a pure corrosion inhibitor, then like here I'm showing corrosion rate as a function of time and here the corrosion inhibitor is injected at time t equal to zero. So what it was observed was if you have a pure corrosion inhibitor molecule, then you don't get very large decrease in the corrosion rate. Okay, so this is corrosion rate as a function of time. You can see that it's not dropping very significantly. But when the metal surface is wetted with oil, when you expose metal surface with oil, then in the presence of the corrosion inhibitor, a significant decrease in the corrosion rate was observed. If you don't have any corrosion inhibitor, you don't see any decrease in the corrosion rate. But if you have corrosion inhibitor and you have exposure to oil, you see a very significant decrease in the corrosion rate. And so the hypothesis that emerged was that uh, if you have water, oil, and you have corrosion inhibitors, you have this kind of uh, adsorb layer. But if you expose with oil, then the oil molecules are getting trapped in the film of corrosion inhibitors. And that is somehow making the corrosion inhibitor film better pack, better packed. And maybe it is becoming better at repulsing water from the surface. So that was the picture that was in mind uh, when um, this, these experiments were performed, which were like, I think in 2014. So here I'm showing you the result of the same surfactants that we took, the same corrosion inhibitors with the polar head group twice the size of the alkyl B. So uh, as I showed before, they form these uh, uh, cylindrical micelles on the surface. This is the close-up of these cylindrical micelles. Okay, so here there are no oil molecules. Then we introduce the oil molecules in the system. These red molecules are the oil molecules. We introduce that, those in the system, this morphology with the one that I'll be showing you, what you will see is that the cylindrical morphology actually gets converted to a linear morphology and the oil molecules get trapped. So what we found is that, yes, the hypothesis that oil molecules are getting trapped in the surfactant layer, this hypothesis is true. But what was not envisioned was that the adsorption morphology itself is changing from cylindrical to planar. And when we have the adsorption morphology changing from cylindrical to planar, you have a significantly more uh, adsorption of these molecules on the surface. And then you have better repulsion of water from the surface. That is the reason why you get uh, better, uh, better corrosion inhibition. Uh, and it is not only in uh, the field of corrosion inhibition that it was that this is observed. This is a paper that appeared very recently. Uh, I just got the preprint. Um, it is in 2021 only. And here the researchers uh, in Japan, they observed this, that initially they have certain surfactant on the surface and you have these warm-like surfactants, warm-like morphology on the surface. They introduce another uh, surfactant and you get a planar morphology on the surface. And then they basically dilute the system and remove one kind of surfactant and they again get back their warm-like configuration. So this is also being observed in the uh, experiments. Okay, uh, so I will conclude the first part of my talk that first alkyl tails play an active role in the absorption of surfactants on metal surfaces. Uh, absorption morphologies depend on the geometry of the surfactants. 
And we have a theoretical model that can predict the adsorb configurations of surfactant molecules. And what we've seen is that co-adsorption of oil molecules can result in morphological changes in the adsorbed surfactant films and they make them better in corrosion inhibition. Okay, so that was all the work that we did using a coarse grain model in which we basically got rid of some chemistry of these molecules. Uh, but we, have, we were also looking at fully atomistic simulations. So what we were doing was in fully atomistic simulations, we do not get rid of the, the chemistry of the molecules. We have the molecules represented in full chemical detail. We have all the oxygens, like you have all the nitrogens and hydrogens, carbons. And we looked at many different molecules which are being used um, in the oil and gas industry. Okay, so we have these surfactants uh, here. We have explicit water molecules in the system. And we started looking at metal as the, uh, we started looking at gold as the metal surface. We did not look at iron because we did not have force fields available for iron when we started doing these studies. But now we have force fields available for iron as well. But gold is a good substitute for iron to study the adsorption behavior. This has been observed in quartz crystal microbalance experiments. And so uh, gold is considered a good replacement, especially when we don't want to have corrosion so that we can actually measure the adsorption. So first we did the simulations in, in, the, in water without any surface. And what we found is that these uh, molecules, they form these spherical micelles in bulk water. Okay, and we've characterized the sphericity of these micelles as a function of their size. I will not go into the details, but this uh, measurement told us that they are actually spherical. Okay, so we were able to measure that they are spherical. So we did something similar. You took, take your molecules, um, you have water molecules, you have your surfactant molecules and you have the metal surface and you just do run a molecular dynamic simulation and you see what happens. And what we observed was that very few molecules actually adsorb on the surface and rest of the molecules basically form these uh, micelles and they float around. And uh, that is not quite right, right? Um, that does not look like the right picture because we know that a lot of molecules actually end up adsorbing uh, on the metal surface. So um, one thing to remember is that uh, a simple molecular dynamic simulations may not give you the equilibrium. Okay, I will tell you why it will not give you the equilibrium. So to explain that, I will tell you a little bit about what is called free energy landscape. So here I am showing you a free energy landscape. Okay, so you have suppose state A and you have state B and uh, if you have learned a bit of thermodynamics, you will know that uh, the most stable state is the one in which the free energy is minimized. Okay, um, so um, state B should be more stable than state A. But to go from state A to state B, you have to overcome this large free energy barrier that you have. And if you basically simulate in state A, then sometimes you're unable to cross this large free energy barrier. Okay, so we have to use special techniques to be able to cross this large free energy barrier to go to the most stable equilibrium state. So we used, um, we do advanced, we use advanced simulation techniques to find the most stable state, not simply uh, running the molecular dynamic simulations. So here, first we started with something very sim simple, single molecule uh, that is being brought to the surface. So here, a single molecule is uh, there is no other molecule, only one surfactant molecule submerged in water at a distance of say like 25 angstrom from the gold surface. And we are bringing this molecule closer and closer to the surface. So initially uh, the molecule is far away from the surface. So there is no change in the free energy. And then when the molecule approaches the surface, you see that there is a decrease in the free energy. So the molecule likes to be close to the surface. And so there is no free energy barrier and there's a very strong adsorption of this molecule on the surface. So the free energy is of the order of 30 to 35 kT, 30 to 35 times the thermal energy, which is a very strong adsorption. So single molecules, uh, so molecule in infinite dilution show very strong adsorption on the metal surface. Then we started looking at cationic micelles. Right? So the spherical positively charged molecules, micelles that we have, we started looking at how these molecules adsorb on the surface. And we saw very different uh, adsorption behavior 
we saw that initially these molecules they experience a large free energy barrier to approach the surface so they experience a large free energy barrier and that is why when we were doing our simulations in which the micelles were formed these micelles were actually not approaching the metal surface because they have this large free energy barrier but once you overcome this free energy barrier then we saw a large decrease in the free energy of the system which means that once you overcome this barrier the molecules adsorb very strongly on the metal surface and what we found is that these molecules basically adsorb strongly by disintegrating on the surface and uh, we have done calculations in which we have figured out what happens in cationic micelles is that you have these micelles which are surrounded by their counter ions because you have positively charged micelle so it will be surrounded by chloride ions which are neutralizing the uh, molecule the the micelle and because you have these chloride ions chloride ions are strongly solvated by water so micelle becomes a very large entity by itself because of this short, large solvation shell and when when it is trying to approach the metal surface this spherical solvation shell is getting disturbed because this solvation shell is getting disturbed you have this free energy barrier to, because you are this is not favorable okay but once you uh, cross the free energy barrier as you can see the entire micelle collapses on the surface and you have a very strong adsorption on the metal surface so uh, to uh, like uh, just to visualize uh, what is happening i'll show you this picture so initially you can see that here are the micelle close to the metal surface we are not uh, letting this micelle to go away from the metal surface uh, then slowly uh, the micelle starts to adsorb on the metal surface uh, and it will change its shape and in the interest of time i'll just forward this movie a bit and you will see that it is disintegrating on the surface and eventually it will completely disintegrate on the surface so it takes a very long time a very long simulation time to be able to completely disintegrate on the surface so we had to wait for a long time for seeing that but that is what we figured out but we wanted to test our result that the disintegration of the micelle is responsible for strong adsorption so what we did was we did more simulations in which we treated the micelle as a rigid body like a rock that it cannot disintegrate okay with simulations you can do that you can treat something as a rigid body not let it disintegrate and so here i'm showing you the rigid micelle simulations as well now uh, what we found is that rigid micelles do not adsorb as strongly like you can see that this is the minimum in the free energy here but it is not a very strong adsorption okay as compared to the micelle in the bulk so the disintegration of the micelle is quite important for strong adsorption we saw the free energy barrier also increases that is because that is because when the micelle is close to the surface when if it is flexible it can rearrange itself to minimize the free energy but that luxury is not this which are rigid so you have a larger free energy barrier so this confirms that disintegration of micelles is required for a uh, strong adsorption then uh, the second part the second part was uh, that the counter ions and the solvation shell is responsible for the free energy barrier so we selected a surfactant molecule uh, which uh, uh, does not have which does not have any charge it is charge neutral and in that surfactant molecule we did not see the free energy barrier which confirmed that it is the solvation shell because of the counter ions that is responsible for the free energy barrier so uh, uncharged micelles should be able to adsorb much more quickly to the metal surface okay uh, so so far we have looked at a single micelle adsorbing on the metal surface and a single molecule adsorbing on the metal surface uh, and we are assuming that nothing else is adsorbing that is not true like you have lot of molecules that will adsorb on the surface and uh, we looked at simple systems to understand how a micelle will behave and how a surfactant molecule will behave but we were actually interested in what is the final equilibrium morphology the surfactant molecules will uh, attain on the metal surface do they attain a self assembled monolayer do they eventually end up forming again spherical morphologies on the surface or do we get some other kind of morphology so we wanted to figure out um what is the equilibrium morphology these micelles these surfactant molecules form on the surface 
Now, uh, going back to the adsorption free energy that I showed you before, we were studying these two systems. Like we were bringing a single molecule on the metal surface and we were bringing a micelle to the metal surface. So our, uh, what we were changing was the distance uh, between the molecule and the metal surface. Now, what we want to look at is how uh, the, the adsorption, how the free energy will change as we change the number of molecules on the surface. So we want, our question is different now. What we want is calculation of a free energy as a function of number of adsorbed molecules. And that will tell, tell us what is the most uh, stable adsorbed morphology on the surface. So suppose we have state A we have, where we have few molecules adsorbed. We can increase the number of molecules adsorbed. We get another state B and so on. We can keep increasing the number of molecules. And finally, we can get completely paired surface with, uh, with surfactants. And uh, for each of these uh, configurations, we should be able to calculate free energy. And by looking at the configuration that has minimum in the free, that is minimum in the free energy, we will know what is the equilibrium morphology of the uh, uh, of the surfactant. Now the problem is that uh, the methods that we use, we basically defined a potential energy and then derivative of the potential energy, derivative of the potential energy as a function of distance, uh, basically gives you the force. But when you are looking at n, like the number of molecules adsorbed, then n is not a differentiable function. You cannot take the derivative of n. So it's a numerical uh, uh, simulation problem that you cannot actually very easily figure out a methodology that will that allow you to increase the number of molecules on the surface. So we uh, developed a new methodology. In what in that methodology, what we def did is we defined what we call is an adsorption number. So what we um, like without going into the, all the math, what we did was instead of having a discrete variable or an integer variable that defines adsorption, like one molecule adsorbed, two molecules adsorbed, three molecules adsorbed, we made it a continuous function. We said that, okay, we can have a continuous function that can approximately tell us how many molecules have been adsorbed on the surface. Now with that continuous function, we can take the derivatives of the potential energy and we can get our forces. So we developed this method and using that, we were able to calculate the free energy of different molecules uh, on the surface. And um, in the interest of time, I will very briefly show you a couple of results that we have got. We have done many different molecules to get the free energy and the adsorbed morphologies of the molecules. Here I'm showing you the free energy as a function of number of adsorbed molecules for quaternary ammonium molecules, which have a 12 carbon alkyl tail. What we found is that they completely covered the surface in the equilibrium morphology. They completely covered the surface. And then in this equilibrium morphology, you have this. So you have the molecules that are lying down and then you have one molecule, one micelle that is sitting on top of the surface. So in, we have atomic force microscopy experimental results in which people have figured, found that you have these micelles which are adsorbed. And this is something that we also are able to see in our experiments, in, in our simulations. Uh, we looked at decane thiol molecules, uh, which are not charged, whereas quaternary ammonium molecules are charged. So when decane thiol molecules are not charged, we saw a much more adsorption and we saw, we saw self-assembled moon layer forming in the equilibrium adsorbed morphology. So these molecules end up forming a self-assembled moon layer, something similar to what we were getting in our uh, uncharged coarse grain models also. Okay. So here our coarse grain simulations and our atomistic simulations match. And uh, I will just skip this slide and I'll just move to conclusions. Uh, so what we find is that we have these surfactant molecules which form spherical micelles. The unaggregated micelle surfactants are able to uh, absorb without any free energy barrier. But the micelles, cationic micelles experience a long range repulsion from the metal surface. Uh, the micelles strongly adsorb only upon disintegration. And now we have a new simulation methodology that allows us to calculate the equilibrium adsorption morphologies of surfactants on the surface. 
Okay, with that, I'll just acknowledge the people who have done the work. Yatish was a master student who started the simulations of fully atomistic simulations. Shreen uh, was a PhD student who has recently graduated. She did all the coarse grain simulations work. Himanshu is a PhD student in my group who is doing all the fully atomistic simulations. And most of the results I have shown for fully atomistic simulations are from Himanshu's work. And all the calculations I have shown for coarse grain simulations are from Shreen. Um, the professors at our corrosion center who have like given us a lot of feedback and um, all the computational resources and the funding that um, I received that has helped us done the work. This was uh, my group before the pandemic. We were so close to each other uh, uh, without mask, as you can see. This is our group. Now we meet over uh, Teams and Zoom. And uh, now I can uh, take some questions. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful talk. That was uh, really interesting. So we'll just go ahead and jump straight into the questions. Uh, Thank we've you. got a number of them. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is, this was from early on in the talk, um, what is the typical size of the seeds that are tested? Okay, uh, that's a good question. So the typical size of, of the, I, I believe seeds, you mean uh, the gold seeds that are in the anisotropic nanoparticles? think so, yes. Yes, yes so yes. those seeds are around uh, two to three nanometers in size. So um, once you have uh, seeds that are two to three nanometers in size, beyond them, they form these, they don't remain spherical, they form these facets. And that's when we have the surfactants which can absorb on different facets of these seeds. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, let's see. So, do okay. Do the hydrophobic films uh, affect the flow properties near the walls? Um, we have not uh, tested that in the experiment in the simulations, mm -hmm. uh, and in the experiments, uh, we have not observed that. So, uh, flow patterns do not change, and uh, uh, flow in general is much smaller than the molecular speeds. So uh, okay. we would also not anticipate flow to change uh, uh, because of these hydrophobic films. Okay. Uh, let's see. When you talk about the alkyl bead, is each bead the same size of carbon length? Yes. Uh, so we are basically like representing one alkyl tail as one bead, one alkyl uh, group as one bead. Okay. In our system. Okay. Um, Okay, so I noticed that in, in some of the in a number of the simulations, you had um, so some of the surfactants were reversed. So the the polar head was actually facing away from the wall. Um, why is that? Yeah, that's a great question, and the reason uh, that is happening is the following: that we, I did not have time to show that result. Mm -hmm. So initially, uh, when the absorption begins, all the polar groups um, basically are are towards the surface, mm -hmm. and then. Um, you don't have more space for the polar groups to be uh, near the surface. Mm -hmm. And then you have a partial bilayer that is getting formed in which the molecules are absorbing solely because of the interactions between the alkyl tails. And so you have upside, upside down molecules which are getting absorbed. Okay. So, so basically, so like if you kept going, like if you, if you put, tried to put more and more surfactant molecules in there, you would eventually end up with something like a bilayer, like a, a full bilayer? Yes. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Uh, let's see. The next question is, uh, was there any change in the pressure or temperature parameters? Uh, no. Uh, we are keeping the temperature and pressure to be constant. We mm -hmm. keep, uh, in our uh, fully atomistic simulations, we keep temperature to be uh, 300 Kelvin, and we maintain the saturation pressure of water in the simulations. And same thing with the coarse grain simulations, we keep the temperature constant. Is that something that you think you'll look at going forward? Or I guess, I guess maybe let me rephrase that. Is, is that something that would be of interest in looking at uh, going forward? Uh, now, uh, pressure uh, in, in general should not have significant effect on our results mm -hmm. because water in general is incompressible. Sure. So you will have very, very high pressures to be able to see any significant change happening in the system. Mm -hmm. um, what is uh, known in ex experiments is that if you have 
a surface which is non uniform so you have some deformities in the surface because of which you have local locally strong eddies mm-hmm. and so you have locally strong pressure and so when you have very high pressures because of uh, lo- locally you have very high pressures that can disturb the surfactant layers okay and so that may be of interest like studying these uh, locally high pressures okay so basically like it's, instead of having a perfectly flat surface introduce uh pits more or less and see how it changes things yes you can have deformities and then you can have more pressure in the system okay to see uh, yeah that that sounds really interesting uh let's see uh how long do these simulations take uh, you know on average i know obviously depending on exactly what you're looking at it varies yeah. but yeah it takes a long time actually uh like uh for the fully atomistic simulations mm-hmm. uh, we use uh, we we parallelize the simulation so we have uh, 24 to uh, maybe 32 processors uh, cpus that mm-hmm. do the simulations parallelly and uh, we to reach uh, like to do the calculations uh, sometimes it takes us a few weeks sometimes it can take us more than few months Oh wow. So they are like we are constantly churning up a lot of uh, CPUs uh, uh, and like millions of CPU hours are used in doing these calculations. Interesting. Can you can you talk a little bit about how how it's parallelized? Like what's because I I imagine you can't do you can't skip steps right because you have, you have time time resolved steps that you need to go through. So what's what's actually being parallelized? Uh, the force calculation so uh, you have you are doing you are calculating force between each pair of atom mm-hmm. and so uh, what you do is uh, you divide the system into small subsystems and so one processor will calculate all the forces between one subsystem mm-hmm. the second processor uh, will calculate all the forces between the second subsystem and then they communicate with each other also but that that communication time is smaller than the individual force calculation time right okay interesting uh let's see would okay this was yeah this is a question i had um would making the polar group have multiple heads um something like a deprotonated carboxylic group help or hurt uh in terms of of forming that surfactant layer so uh so you you want multiple polar groups like do you have do you want to have more than one polar group yeah, or so so I, i think what what i'm imagining is like you you have the long alkyl tail like you talked about but then at the point the 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 group that's actually at the surface of the metal has multiple points of contact basically so not not like oh, a, not okay. a larger head necessarily but like right. multiple individual heads yeah that's an interesting question and uh, we have actually not explored it that much we do see uh, that in our fully atomistic simulations where we have multiple points of uh, uh, adsorption mm-hmm. um now whether it will hurt now it can uh, it depends on uh, what kind of geometry you have of the polar group sure so um, i can talk about uh, the fully atomistic simulations where we have multiple points of contact what we see is that if you have the aromatic ring then the aromatic ring likes to prefers to lie parallel to the surface mm-hmm. and so uh, so that it has all the carbons uh, on the surface and uh, sometimes if the geometry does not allow for uh, molecules like if you have many molecules adsorbing on the surface mm-hmm. then the molecule will prefer to bend so that you have alkyl tails which are uh, standing up on the surface even keep while keeping the uh, aromatic ring uh, on the surface well, that's interesting so, So we have observed these kind of con- conformational changes in the surfactant molecules, so that they can allow more molecules to adsorb with their aromatic rings on the surface. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. I would not have. Would not. I wouldn't have expected that. Yeah, that was a nice, interesting result we saw. Yeah. No kidding. Uh, let's see. What is okay? What's the max diameter that you have observed in the cylindrical assemblies? I guess in in like the in the micelles. Yes uh, so the maximum diameter so we have the diameter is in between one uh, one molecular length and less than two molecular lengths okay so we have actually like because of uh, we are limited by the system size we cannot as we keep increasing the system size the number of water molecules increase and the number of 
surfactant molecules increase that increases the computational time sure. so we have not looked at very big micelles we deliberately look at small micelles so there is a possibility that big bigger micelles can form so uh, but we have not like explored that because of our limitations i got you um for this okay so this was uh uh, a question about basically can, can you talk a little bit more about how how you'll take the the molecular simulations and apply it to the real life setting so like you mentioned oil pipelines so how do, mm -hmm. how does this get translated from the simulation into uh, the actual application that the, the companies are interested in yes that's a great question and uh, the uh, one way we can apply it is the following that uh, by looking at the molecular geometry like we connected the molecular geometry to the kind of morphologies the molecules form. So if suppose we want to design a new uh, corrosion inhibitor molecule, then by looking at the relative size of the polar head group and the alkyl tail, we can predict what kind of adsorption morphology the molecule will form. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we can suggest that maybe you can decrease the size of your polar head group by chopping off um, some, some moieties. Uh, and, and that way you will be able to get better coverage or maybe we can suggest if you have a bigger polar head group and the alkyl tail then mix don't have a single formulation single pure uh, compound mm -hmm. mix it with a linear linear alkane or linear alkyl group uh, so that you can form these uh, these mixed surfactant layers that i showed mm -hmm. which are better packing so we can oh, uh, yeah. tell people about that okay we, yeah. eh, and from the fully atomistic simulations, we can tell them whether you have the micelles forming on the surface or um, oh, can you change something and can you form a planar self-assembly layer? We can predict those. That makes sense. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's probably uh, for on, on their end, it's probably a lot simpler to come to you and say, hey, we're looking at this, you know, this surfactant. And you see what mm -hmm. it does <laughs> instead yes. of them having to like throw it in a pipeline or, or a test bed somewhere and say, you know, then do all the characterization that's involved and hope that they're getting it right and not missing anything. Certainly, yeah. yes. No, that, that makes and, a lot of sense. And the simulation results do give a direction to think. Like, mm -hmm. what will happen? Like, they know now that if the polar head group is getting bigger, then what, what problems can happen? So if they see reduction in the corrosion in inhibition, then maybe it's the morphology that is changing. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see. Yeah, so instead of having to kind of, of blindly try different things, you can mm -hmm. you can use the molecular simulations to to guide guide yourself a little bit more accurately, but not waste many resources. Certainly. So that's a great use for it. Um, it looks like that's all the questions we've got. So uh, anybody wants to get any last minute last minute one in last minute questions in, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, but in the meantime, I'll go ahead and say thank you uh, to Dr. Sharma. That was a super interesting talk. That, that's a really, a really cool use of, of molecular simulations. And, and I learned a lot. <laughs> that's, that's really, yeah. really interesting work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, for the invitation. And Absolutely. thank you for, uh, thank you everyone for listening uh, on a Friday night. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, listening to the questions. Uh, they were very pertinent and uh, very nice questions. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. I'm glad, I'm glad you had a good time. Um, yeah. I think that's, uh, the, that's, like, that's all the questions we have. Um, so if I could get you to hang around for just a second, uh, Dr. Sharma, sure. we'll talk very briefly in just a minute. Um, okay. Thank you to everybody for, to everybody for coming out. Um, I hope you all have a great weekend. Uh, let's see. Next week we have uh, Dr. David Ziegler uh, from the uh, – uh, University of California, uh, UCA, UCA, University of California, Poly San Luis Obispo uh, from chemistry department there. Um, and so uh, we, another great talk to look forward to. Uh, in the meantime, everybody have a great weekend uh, and I hope I will see you next week. Um, and uh, I'll drop the, the Discord link one more time for anybody that's, that they want to join that. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, have a wonderful weekend, everybody, and uh, we'll see you.